have pro-inflammatory cells, we have anti-inflammatory cells, we have a degree of hyperinflammation, uh, sometimes in parallel with immunosuppression and sometimes even immunoparalysis. And there are lots of different cells involved and different biomarkers and mediators. At the same time, we also know that sepsis is a dynamic problem where things evolve. Patients may be very inflamed for a while and then become less inflamed and then for a while they may even be immunoparalyzed. And all this has implications for therapy and also for the development of organ dysfunction. When we talk about the combination of acute kidney injury and sepsis, we, as I've already alluded to, don't fully understand what goes on because there are some patients who develop acute kidney injury almost in parallel with the development of sepsis. And then there are some patients who have a septic for a while and then develop acute kidney injury. And it can be hard to tease out whether the AKI is actually the result of sepsis or whether it was caused by something else. But at the moment, we call all of these uh, combinations sepsis-associated acute kidney injury. And then it gets even worse because after the onset of acute kidney injury in patients with sepsis, lots of different trajectories may occur. Some patients may recover very quickly. Some patients may progress to severe acute kidney injury needing renal replacement therapy and then recover again and their creatinine returns to baseline. And others do not recover kidney function and may be left with prolonged acute kidney disease or even chronic kidney disease or sometimes end-stage renal failure. So the trajectories and the in of individual patients are very variable. And the question is, why is this? And are may is this all the same disease? Or are we talking about different types of sepsis-associated acute kidney injury? But before I talk about the, the implications, I just want to demonstrate and, and remind everybody why acute kidney injury is common and why the kidneys are so vulnerable in sepsis. Just as a reminder, the uh, kidneys are obviously very vascular organs. And on the vascular level, you could almost distinguish between two different forms of circulation. You have the glomerular capillaries responsible for glomerular filtration, and then you have the peritubular microcirculation responsible to support the, peri the tubular cells. If we accept that sepsis is an endothelial disease with vasoplegia, increased permeability, and the formation of microthrombi, then it's clearly not surprising that the kidneys may well be affected and implicated in sepsis given that the kidneys are such vascular organs. And that's what you can see in uh, animals, for instance, with acute kidney injury in the context of sepsis. At histology, there will be features of thrombi in the blood vessels. There will be signs of coagulation activation, and there will be signs of inflammation and uh, endothelial dysfunction. And we believe these processes occur in pay, can occur in patients with sepsis and can occur in the renal vessels. At the same time, we also know that glomerular function it can be affected directly as a result of changes in vascular tone. Normally, obviously, glomerular filtration depends on the close relationship between the afferent and the efferent artery, but this relationship and the hemodynamics are altered in sepsis. And they may be so altered that actually pre-existing uh, shunts open up and to the point that the glomerula may be completely bypassed. And there's evidence that this happens, which is now more than 40 years old. So if this obviously happens, then glomerular filtration may be completely bypassed or, and may cease. The tubulus, tubular cells are very uh, sensitive and very vulnerable in sepsis for numerous reasons. Firstly, obviously, because the microcirculation may be affected, but they're also at the, uh, directly at the receiving end of toxic metabolites and various inflammatory mediators. So obviously, the uh, 
tubular cells receive, are at the receiving end of everything that gets filtered out at glomerular level and in sepsis. This will affect dams and PAMs and associated inflammatory mediators. This then, together with the impaired microcirculation, really causes stress in tubular cells and may lead to um, apoptosis and at some, point, at some stage even cell death, where the cells are atta being attacked from both sides, from within the lumen and also by not receiving adequate support from the microcirculation. And if you then finally combine this with shunting, where then the glomeruli also, uh, their glomerular function ceases, it's easily understandable why kidney function will be, could be impaired in sepsis. In addition, uh, the kidneys are at, also at the receiving end of inflamed and activated inflammatory cells. Plus, in sepsis, they can themselves activate cells and these activated cells can then leave the kidneys, get into the systemic circulation, and contribute to the cytokine uh, release. It's also been shown that uh, sepsis is a mitochondrial disease, and we now know that this affects tubular cells and cells within the kidney. Normally, we have a very good uh, and a stable balance between uh, mitochondria that fuse and split, and this relationship is uh, stable in health. It turns out that in conditions associated with cell stress, including acute kidney injury, the shift is more towards splitting, and uh, the organs end up with tiny fragmented mitochondria. And these fragmented mitochondria are less efficient, and they're also vulnerable, more vulnerable to um, to any further stress. And if severe and the mitochondrial function ceases completely, cell death may occur. If the mitochondria are not working well, then various uh, energy processes within the kidney will be compromised, and the kidneys co compensate by shifting their substrate production. And uh, Ultimately, it leads to a decrease in ATP production. They also try to compensate by down-regulating any ATP-consuming processes and by shutting down the cells and going into cell cycle arrest to protect themselves. But ultimately, it means that the tubular cells will not be functioning as normal. So these are processes that can all occur as a result of sepsis. We obviously need to recognize that patients with sepsis may also be at risk of acute kidney injury from many other causes. Just drugs alone, for instance, aminoglycosides, may cause, directly cause acute kidney injury. There may be hemodynamic instability. There may be some cardiac problems as a result of sepsis or independent uh, leading to impaired kidney function. Patients may have uh, other reasons causing acute kidney, like, for instance, obstruction. And again, obstruction may be extra, but also could be intratubular. Patients may get acute kidney. There may be a contribution from renal congestion as a result of right-sided heart failure or just simple fluid overload. And then finally, patients may not start off with normal kidney function. They may actually have very reduced kidney function as a result of CKD. And this means that patients who develop both sepsis and acute kidney injury can have acute kidney injury for so many different reasons, and it's impossible to tease out whether it was sepsis-induced or sepsis-associated. And the safest uh, term is probably sepsis-associated acute kidney injury. So because the kidneys are so, so uh, vascular, that makes them extremely vulnerable in sepsis. Now, when this happens, then clearly we want to, uh, patients need to be treated, and ideally we would like to protect the kidneys, and we would like to stop them developing acute kidney injury, and we would like to stop progression to severe acute kidney injury. I've already alluded to the fact that all these patients will be very different, and they will have different um, initial 
triggers for acute kidney injury. When it comes down to the management and the potential role of new diagnostic tools, then at the moment, all we can say is that uh, to protect kidneys in this context, patients should be treated as optimally as possible for underlying sepsis because the underlying sepsis management will then also protect kidney function. And at present, we have no specific therapy for sepsis-associated acute kidney injury independent of sepsis management. Now, studies have looked at other things and have looked at uh, removing particular cytokines to protect kidneys, and that was unsuccessful. And the role of blood purification for the sole purpose of protecting the kidneys is uncertain. So to, do, to use blood purification in patients who still have normal kidney function for the aim to protect kidneys uh, is unclear. So the management consists of optimal, timely management and uh, management of sepsis. But this raises, uh, brings us to another important point because we, the sepsis management consists of hemodynamic stabilization, vasopressors if needed. And at present, we don't even know what the optimal vasopressor should be for patients at risk of sepsis. And that's an important point because the different vasopressors vary in their, action, in their, their uh, action point and their characteristics. And clearly, if you have a vasopressor that acts predominantly on the afferent branch of the glomeruli, glomerular filtration will cease. In contrast, a vasopressor with predominant action on the efferent branch could increase glomerular filtration. And it's really important because these existing vasopressors which we use uh, in clinical practice act on different parts of the nephron. And just as an example, angiotensin, for instance, acts predominantly on the efferent branch of the glomerular vasculature. And the sub-analysis of the Athos III study suggested that angiotensin may have a role in helping patients to recover from acute kidney injury. So the Athos III was a randomized controlled trial looking at uh, the role of angiotensin II in patients with septic shock or noradrenaline. And in a sub-analysis, they looked at all the patients who were on renal replacement therapy at enrollment. There were a total of 105, of whom uh, 45 had received angiotensin or were randomized to angiotensin. So they were all on renal replacement therapy at randomization. And as you can see here, the straight line are the people who received angiotensin. In this graph, we have the uh, liberation from renal replacement therapy. And as you can see, the patients who were randomized to, rand to angiotensin came off renal replacement therapy faster compared to patients on placebo. Now, this is a suggestion. It fits with physiology because angiotensin acts on the efferent branch. But this would have to be repeated in a clinical trial before we uh, advocate that angiotensin should be used to help patients coming off the filter. So I hope I've convinced you that sepsis-associated AKI essentially is a description of a person who has both sepsis and AKI, and they may have AKI because of sepsis, but in most cases, most likely be in it as a result of sepsis plus something else. And there are all these other contributing factors that play a role. So the pre-existing risk factors, pre-existing comorbidities, it is possible that the source of sepsis may play a role. And then the general processes of care, how we resuscitate them, which fluids, which antibiotics, which pressors. If we accept that sepsis-associated AKI is the term to use, then we still at the same time have to acknowledge that even all sepsis-associated acute kidney injury uh, varies, and there are so many different phenotypes. And this may be important because different phenotypes may respond differently to therapies. And I'll just show you an example to support this. Here's a um, sub-analysis of uh, two, or analysis of the data of two large ICU data sets. One with ICU patients with systemic inflammation and possible infection, and patients with inflammation and ARDS. 
And as part of the data collection, the team also collected biomarkers. And in this sub-analysis, they focused on patients where they had biomarkers uh, describing the endothelial and inflammatory pathways. And then did some uh, AI uh, latent analysis, which helped them identifying two different sub-phenotypes. So to the outside world, on paper, they all had inflammation, and they were in the ICU, and they were critically ill. And they identified two types of patients with AKI. And they were, they were very different with regards to these four biomarkers. These are all biomarkers related to endothelial function and inflammatory pathways. They were all different. They looked different. And they also had a different prognosis. So patients with so-called subphenotype 2 had a much worse prognosis, much higher risk of dying, and a much higher risk of not recovering kidney function. So the patients were identified using these two databases. And then the team uh, applied the same biomarkers and the same characteristics to a different database. And this was the VAST database, which is a randomized controlled trial looking at the role of vasopressin in patients with sepsis or noradrenaline. And they could also show, again, that patients were, could be identified. There were two different types of uh, AKI, different subphenotypes. But in this case, there was also a difference in response. So patients with subphenotype 2 did not benefit from the addition of vasopressin. Mortality was equally, uh, was equally in both groups. But in patients with subphenotype 1 had a clear benefit from receiving vasopressin uh, at a lower mortality and a lower risk of non-recovery. And so this means looking at these different subphenotypes may help us in future identifying those patients who will, are likely to respond better to a particular treatment and it may also identify those who are completely unlikely to respond or may even come to harm. And I think these results are important, especially since we're still we're on this ongoing search to find uh, treatments and drugs for acute kidney injury. And various drugs are currently undergoing clinical trials. So far, we've never identified a drug for acute kidney injury. But it may be that we've just applied them to a group of people who are just too uh, mixed and different, and by identifying different subphenotypes, even if we talk about sepsis, and identifying those who are likely to respond, we will in future find a drug. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that uh, sepsis-associated acute kidney injury has many features and many different causes, and there are many potential contributing processes involved, from disturbed microcirculation to endothelial dysfunction to mitochondrial dysfunction, but also non-sepsis-related factors, like drugs, re renal congestion. Further insight will help us, I believe, identifying those who are li more likely to respond to a particular therapy. But until then, the management of sepsis-associated AKI is, consists of good management of sepsis, and there's not a, no specific man uh, treatment at the moment. Thank you for your attention.